you for joining us for the Awakening Weeks. Um, this first week is the UK Awakens. Hi, I'm Luis, and I'm very happy to welcome you to Sex, Sodomy, and Scandal in London's History with Imagine Experiences. So this virtual experience is a part of Ticket's Awakening Weeks, a six-week celebration of the reopening of 100 museums and attractions in six countries around the world. These venues have worked night and day to reimagine their experiences and introduce new hygiene measures to make it sure you can all visit again. Now they're rolling out the welcome mat with these online experiences for those who aren't able to travel yet, but still want to experience and reawaken cultural institutions worldwide. This virtual experience will start soon, but as people are still joining us, I'll kick us off by sharing some logistical info about what to expect and how to use Zoom. So if you have any questions for the presenter, you can submit them through this uh, Q&A button at the bottom in the center of the Zoom window. There'll be a Q&A at the end of the presentation, so feel free to send through the questions and we'll try to answer them. Um, so, great. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, use the chat to send a message to all panelists and we'll try to help you out as soon as possible. If you're having trouble with audio, leave, uh, leaving and rejoining is usually the easy fix. Finally, this presentation will be recorded and we'll be sending out the recording to all registrants in the coming weeks. So without further ado, I'm happy to hand over to our host for this virtual experience, Mel Adams, Lucy Addy Compton, Andy Jackson, and Carol Krupp, Krook for a trip back in time. So imagine experiences, take it away. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm and fluffy, salacious welcome to London town. We are in a very, very beautiful area at the moment, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to take you back to the 18th century when this area would have looked slightly different. It would have been very bustly with halls, pimps, banyos, brothel houses, and all sorts of naughty goings on. We are in Covent Garden, and you may remember a scene in a film from the play George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, the musical version, My Fair Lady, Eliza Doolittle sits on this very spot and she sings a song. All I want is a room somewhere far away from the cold night air with one enormous... <laughs> I shall stop there. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Leonard Pink, international homosexual and celebrity historian. Uh, but for today's purposes, you could call me Bo, Bo Buttocks, yes. And let me introduce you to my merry band of troubadours. Holly, follow me, come on. This is all going to be action packed, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to give you salacious tales of times gone by, follow me. Oh, oh ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the merry band of Troubadours. Introducing Madam Speedy Hand <laughs> and the lovely a Gentleman Jack. Oh, don't you know. Like Moving on. Oh, the thief taker himself. And this is the wonderful, naughty Mickey Spasm. <laughs> service. And finally, last but not least, I give you the one and only, the mellifluous, the wonderful, the fabulous, Princess Bagarento. <laughs> Hello, darling. Hello, girl. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, Polly, just pan round a little bit. Let's have a look at the scene today. Let's have a look at Covent Garden today. This fabulous church, which is just before us at the moment, is called St. Paul's. And it was designed by a gentleman called Inigo Jones, and it first opened its doors in 1632, when this area was a little bit different. 
So let's cut to the 18th century, shall we? Shall we go to the 18th century and what was going on here in this bustling square? Baldy houses, brothel houses, banyos. Prostitution, ladies and gentlemen, was a plenty in this area. And we have a little bit of an expert on this immersive, theatrical experience today. The wonderful Madam Speedyham. So, Madam Speedyham, could you give us a little description of what was going on in this area? Well, Leonard, total vice was happening in this area in the 18th century. This would have all been brothels with harlots scrambling around the piazza, selling their goods. Oh, and were there famous madams in this area? Very famous madams, actually, Leonard. Mm -hmm. I was one of them, of uh, course. Name some names. Well, uh, Elizabeth Wiseborn. Oh, well, she was an amazing businesswoman, actually, because this is a time when this is how women got power, selling themselves oh, yeah. and making money by selling other women as well. Now, she had her brothel just over there on Jury Lane. Mm -hmm. But, of course, they still lived on the edge of the law a little bit, and they wanted this air of decency to be. So what she would do is a beautifully dressed house, elegant and furbished, refurbished and everything like that. And she would carry her Bible around with her. She was nobody in question, only oh, this woman. And she would walk through the streets, clutching her Bible to her bosom. Oh, wow. But you also had different degrees of ladies of the night as well. You had your two penny bunters. So oh, what was a two penny bunter? Well, that was if you were just down a little back street for a little knee trend level. Oh. 15 minutes oh. at most. Then you had uh, your harlots, which you had in this area. This yeah. was your harlots. And oh, you may have seen the programme, ladies and gentlemen. It's, well, it's certainly here in this country at the moment. Harlots. If you haven't seen it, watch it. BBC uh, catch up. Yes, there we go. And uh, they were in the boarding houses and they had rooms. They would rent by the act or the night. Then you had the courtesans. Oh, yeah. They were down in St. James's, darling. They were uh, very much, uh, you know, the high class. So, poi ploi. Yeah. Yeah. Poi ploi. So could you explain a little bit about the differences between baldy houses, banyos, and temples? Ah, well, the temples, you see, they were a little bit more elegant. They had, like, tableaux and performances where you would buy tickets to come and watch certain performances of young ladies and then join in and have one big party. Mm. The banyos were, like, a little bit sleepy. Yeah. Kind of. They what? were places where you would go to, darling. Oh, I see. They were a little bit Romanesque, weren't they? About Very you? Romanesque. It's like a it's like a bathhouse, basically. And if you procured a gentleman from the streets around here, you would take them down there for a little bit of, you know, <laughs> it's a bit early for that, but <laughs> stick with us. <laughs> so let's take these people on a little tour of where we are. And don't forget, you are joining us. We're doing little highlights for you today. You're joining us almost at the end of our soiree around London town. So follow us. Through. Now we're going to go into the piazza. The piazza. Follow me this way, please. Oh, I nearly fell over. <laughs> so I just want to explain a little bit about different cultures um, that we had developing during this particular time, the 18th century. And one of the cultures that was very, very apparent, certainly in these regions, the Covent Garden area, was gay subculture. Cultures. Yes, I'm talking LGBTQI. Of course, they didn't have this establishment back in those days. So. Oh, yes, Could you tell me a little bit about what was going on with gay subculture? Well, at the time, back in the 18th century, there were being gay was illegal, you carried the death sentence if you were caught in the act. However, there was an active underground gay scene. At any point throughout the 18th century, there were about two dozen molly houses operating here in London. A molly house was like an early gay club. A like gay bar. Yeah, yes. like a gay bar. Yeah, so yeah. these would operate sometimes in a pub, sometimes in a back room, or sometimes in a private house. And in fact, this street here, the street behind it, now known as Floral Street. Behind it, Floral Street. 28th of December 1727, there was a raid on the Molly House and 25 men were arrested and charged. Um, some of them were known sodomites, catamites, homosexuals. Um, however, what's interesting is they put up a fight, they didn't go easily. They put up a fight and none of them were actually charged for the offence, the abominable crime of sodomy, because you had to be caught in the act. That's how, that's how they would catch you. So how would they catch you in the act? Well, you would 
Was it surveillance? Like, well, what's surveillance? There was a Society for the Reformation of Mammoths. Oh. Which was like a cross between the National Trust and the Stasi. <laughs> and they had spies <laughs> on each corner. And they were watching people's private lives. They would grasp you up to the authorities. And they would capture them and get documentary evidence of your actions. Yeah. And they would try and get eyewitnesses. So some less trustworthy owners of molly houses would yes. actually grasp on their own customers uh, but some more trusty owners of molly houses will provide real safe spaces and there are records of weddings taking places in these molly houses oh. and these were taken sometimes as part of the fun but also sometimes as a genuine commitment between two men oh i see so one would dress as uh, the bride and the other would yeah, they were both dressed as brides, actually. Oh. They were both dressed as brides. And we have a first hand account. There was a highwayman called Jack Dalton, and he was sentenced to death for being a highwayman. But before he was sentenced to death, he gave his life story, and this was published in a pamphlet. And he gave a first hand account of what, what an actual Molly House wedding was like. Yeah. So there were two brides, if yeah. you will, and there were bridesmaids. And one of the bridesmaids became quite famous. She was called Princess Serafina. And she was the first recognised drag queen. Ah. I don't know why you're looking at me, I'm a woman. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. Thank you. I do bet your father, I'm sure. <laughs> no, Princess Serafina was the first recognised drag queen, as in a man for whom his identity was based on dressing as a woman. And he was in uh, 1732, a court case, where he accused another man of theft. It went to court, and in court it all came out that Princess Serafina, or John Cooper was his real name, lived his life as a woman, dressed as Princess Serafina, and was called Princess Serafina. What's interesting about the court case, though, is that he was not under prosecution himself. He was the prosecuting witness. And despite it coming out that he was a sodomite, a catamite, and a molly, terms for gay men, he himself was never actually charged because there was no evidence that he'd done anything. I see. He was caught in the act. I see. You had to be caught in the act. So of course there weren't surveillance cameras around at that time, ladies and gentlemen. So these, um, they were known as tree panners, the Society of the Reparation of Manners. Um, and they basically used to spy on people, you know, so it would be literally, literally on the corner, you know, with something in front of them going, oh, what's going on over there? Is that a bit of buggery taking place? Oh, I'm going to report them. But there had to be two of them. They had to see them in the act. Now, did they have an examination when they were caught? They did have an examination, basically, an emission of sperm needed to have taken place, and it had to yeah. be inside the body. So we all produce it, just come on, it's just a word. But a common trick was to make sure that the emission of sperm took place outside the body, because that would simply be gross indecency. Uh, and that just carried a mere sentence of pillory. Ah, uh, right, okay, I see. Right, now I want to find out exactly what was going on with the uh, females at this particular time. Lesbianas, shall we call them? Although they weren't known as that in those days, they were known as flats. Yes, flats. Get it? <laughs> Follow me. Come on, Holly. Hope you're all there. Give us a wave if you're there. Can you see them, Holly? Are they saying hello? No, there's no one there. Come on, hurry up. This way. Okay, I'm going to take you into the piazza now. And today, as you can see, it's got what they call the apple market. Now, don't forget, once upon a time, Covent Garden was a flower. Market. So yes, Eliza Doolittle would have sold her flowers in this particular area. But a lot of the girls that worked as flower sellers didn't make a great deal of money. So they used to turn tricks as well. Yes. Now, just to explain, back in the 18th century, if you were a woman and you wanted to work, unfortunately there wasn't a great deal of offers out there. You could become a housemaid, you'd probably be paid five pounds a year. And then the alternative, of course, was whoring, because there you could earn five pounds a week. It's not rocket science, is it really? So not a lot of option. Anyways, let's go and talk about the girls and see what they were up to. Now we're gonna go into the Apple Market and there's a, a market tier here selling some sort of produce. We're gonna have a little word and it's Gentleman Jack. Oh, quick, quick, quick. We have to hurry. We have to hurry. Oh, in the one remaining item that we have left here today. Yes. This area, rather a little bit like the 18th century version of the Anne Summers store, which you may be familiar with. Yes. And here um, we have a wonderful example. It's the only one left, yes. but there was such a roaring trade. This area was overflowing. 
with such influence. So in the 18th century, you could come to a market. Yes. Am I correct? Not only a market, you could go to many of the squares and gardens and parks yes. here in Westminster, Mayfair, and there you would find ladies and gentlemen with baskets selling them quite openly okay. and doing a roaring trade. Yeah. Do do, do do sell. It's something like that anyway. Am I right? More or less, yes. <laughs> I say. Yes. Now, if you were to buy one today, a genuine 18th century version, depending on what it was made of, you can expect to pay around five thousand pounds. And they do come up occasionally. Oh, auction. modern day. Yes. Oh, okay. So, how much would one pay, say, in the 18th century? Just a matter of a few pence, depending again on what it was made of. Yeah. And what were they made of? <coughs> Leather, uh, stone sometimes. This one um, seems Neolithic to me. And actually, you could buy them second hand too, as you put condoms. <laughs> so already used. Yes. Used condom, used builder to sell. One careful owner. <laughs> Have you ever spoken in 20 feet with shame before now? <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, we do like to have a little bit of a laugh on this immersive theatrical experience. So if you do come along, prepare to giggle quite a lot. So let's take you further now. Let's penetrate deep into the piazza. Follow me this way. Can we consider it sold? Oh. Sorry, I was running off with it. Shoplifting a, car, a dildo. That's not very good, is it, really? There we go. I'll take it back in your careful hands. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, Common Garden today is a different species to what it would have been in the 18th century. During the 18th century, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to imagine, even at this time of day, I think we're around about 11 o'clock, it would have been bustling absolutely busy 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 with people that have been working the night shift and those people that will be taking over the day shift and i am talking prostitution and this is where everybody gravitated to it was like the epicenter of whoredom here now don't forget a few facts about london london has always been known or certainly in the 18th century as the sex capital of Europe. It was known as the Sodom and Gomorrah. So if you're abroad in one of your countries and you may think you've got a very good sex scene now, if you'd come here in the 18th century, you could have got absolutely anything one would have desired. So come on, let's go and penetrate a little bit more. This way, this way. Do keep up, cars. Come around, come around. Let's go down here. Let's go down this passage. Who oh, can keep up, girls? Can keep up? It's a trouble. We've got a few people training around with us today. A little bit slow. Oh, very. Oh, it smells absolutely beautiful around here. Of course, it's not really reminiscent of the 18th century. It would have probably smelled a little bit of sulphur in these uh, particular regions, and this was because of the bath houses. Remember, we were explaining the banyos. Now, what I'd quite like to talk about now. It's, you're probably thinking to yourself, but there's all this sexual activity going on on the streets. What laws were in place during this particular time? What was the law? So where is my expert? There, the thief taker himself, oh, Mr. Mickey Spatham. So, your service. Yes, give us a little uh, rendition of what laws were around at this particular time. Oh, in the first part of the 18th century, it's down to the individual citizen to catch the wrongs, like highwaymen. Do come yeah. through, do come through. Yeah. He'll give you a reward. Yeah. 40 pound for a highwayman, the chance of getting his horse. But the rewards just led to people like me, the thief takers, mm. who would return people's goods at an extortionate price. Oh. And we had armies of burglars, thieves, pickpockets, muggers, highwaymen, all working for us. And if they didn't come up with the goods, I could send them to the gallows and get their reward. Yeah. So it's very lucrative business. Oh, I can imagine, yes. Yeah. So, um, we're going to be talking about a certain gentleman that used to, um, well, he um, came out with a publication, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, a gentleman called Jack Harris. 
Um, but can you tell me, so if you were a whore on the street, could you actually be arrested for this? Well, you could be arrested for soliciting, but not, you know, they wouldn't be as bad as the sodomites you could get pillory. Yes, or hung. Oh, or hung. Yes. Well hung. Yes. Yes, uh, well hung. <laughs> Well, you can't make it up on this tour, you know. <laughs> but the Society of Reformation of Manners, oh. especially in 1731, they went around using people like me, banging on the doors, okay. or smashing their back doors in, even. <coughs> and, like I said, we're on the form today. Putting Mother Needham, they put her in the pillory. Ah, now, Mother, Mother Needham was a very famous, yeah. um, known as the Hag of Hell. She was a board, uh, a procurer, a madam, wasn't she? She was indeed what very, to her? very aristocratic one. She thought she'd be a bit more immune. Oh. She was an aristocratic area. Even the Prince of Wales used to pop around for tea, yes. a bit of grumpy yes. on occasion. Yes. But she did get a knock, banging on her door, oh. which she back doors, etc. Yep. And they took her to the pillory, and such a crowd formed because they all wanted to punish her for all those women she'd been corrupting and sending down this never ending trail of. Prostitution from a yes. very young age, yes, yes. and they gave her such a help that she very, very, very almost died after that first yes. period. Yes. The pillory, yes. ladies and gentlemen, it's like stops, yes, you'd stand yes. there, you and they'd have carts that came along with dead cats and potatoes. Oh, yeah. yeah. They'd be throwing, yeah. throwing everything at you oh. bricks and bats and yeah. dead cats and yeah. cow hats. And so, 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 so she nearly died, nearly died, yeah. Yeah. but she died three days later after. Especially in great fear and anguish that happened to do it all the time. Yeah. It just shows you how bad people thought about these pageants, especially her. Yeah. The hags of hell. The hags of hell indeed. Yes, yeah. yes indeed. Yeah. So let's carry on now a little bit. Um, come this way, Halls, and bring the uh, lovely people at home with you. Yeah. Come up here. Brother Rento, come here, my darling. Um, can you also um, just expand a little bit on the law? So say you were visiting around here one dark night, or well, then um, Princess Sarazina lived as a woman. Would one feel, would one feel sort of, you know, energized and, you know, happy to receive the attention, or would you be quite sort of incognito? Well, it depends if you have any evidence to do people like Princess Seraphina, she lived her life openly as a prospecting man. Yeah. But she was popular with her friends and her neighbours. Yeah. If you were unpopular, you lived your life in fear. Everybody was out to get something of everybody else. But life was hard back then. Yeah. You could make a quick buck by blasting somebody else up, then you would. Yeah. So most people, most gay men, lived their lives in constant fear. Because if they were caught, then the sense of death yeah. Um, and that stayed on the statute until 1861. Uh, yeah. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, and the decriminalization, of course, of uh, male homosexual act didn't come until 1967 in this country later. And that was only a partial decriminalization as well. So, anyways, let's carry on. Come through the piazza. And as you can see today, um, there's lots of nice shops here. Uh, lots of uh, nice people walk around here. I mean, really, it's quite a nice area to come to. And you can relax with its bars, its restaurants. It's al fresco um, environment in this particular region. But don't forget, in the 18th century, it would have been a little bit rougher, a little bit more, you know, rough and ready, shall we say. Oh, let's go out here. Come this way, Holly. Let's do a quick step now. Come on, everyone. Keep up, please. No talking in the back. Right, now we're sort of heading towards Jury Lane at the moment. You might be able to see right in front of you, uh, covered in uh, disguise at the moment. That's the Theatre Royal, Jury Lane. Uh, the oldest theatre in London, actually. Uh, rather large theatre. So I think it has a capacity of 4,000 seats. Yeah. But quite a nice little venue. And here we go. Let's go down here. That's it. Follow us this way, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I feel a bit like Annika Rice. I don't know if you're old enough to remember that. Treasure hunt? No, am I wasting my time? No, whatever. Okay, guys. Right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. We have arrived on the north, uh, east side of the square now. Now, if we just zoom over there, Holes, you can see uh, a rather uh, modern 
portico, uh, basically. But once upon a time, on that particular site over there in the corner, which is now the entrance to the Royal Opera House, there used to be a very, very famous pub, a public house, a bar, and it was known as the Shakespeare's Head. And the master of the ass uh, was a gentleman known as Jack Harris. And he came up with the first publication of the Whores of Covent Garden. So let's expand on that. Lucy, darling. Yes, Leonard. Can you tell me a little bit about Jack Harris and his very famous publication? I can, as it happens. So Jack Harris, we also know him as the Pimp Master General. So started off handwritten notes, keeping little notes of uh, his little uh, whores he would do business with. He was a uh, waiter at the Shakespeare Head and also the most famous pimp as well. Anyway, his whores, Almanac, sold all over Covent Garden, could only buy it after midnight, two shillings a two. copy. And it, it was quite an honour if you were a whore at that time and you got yourself into this publication, wasn't it? They wanted to be in this book yeah. because then you, you would have been like an influencer today, then. That's what it would be oh, like. Oh, an influencer. Like there we influencer. go. There's a modern term. And they were buying. Hashtag, hashtag <laughs> influencer. <laughs> so they were buying to get in this book and uh, there was hundreds of them and all these descriptions so you knew exactly you were getting. I see. Okay, and he was over there at the Shakespeare's head. Shakespeare's head. Do we have any samples of uh, what was written in this publication? Do you have one for we us? We certainly do. Yes. Um, but I think Princess Bogorenko has the best one. Oh. Well, there was a young girl from Hong Kong. Do come through. Do come through. are very interactive on this tour, you know. <laughs> She's a young girl called Old Forest, if I knew her well. Uh, she lived on St. Martin's Lane. She doesn't get a very good review. Oh, uh, Harris describes that she was probably, she was a publican's daughter, and she was perhaps debauched in her father's pub. Yes. Um, and he sums up the review with his direct quote. He says, in a homely term of phrase, she's nothing but a vile bitch. Meanwhile, on this street here, Russell Street, there was a woman called Bet. Uh, she gets an absolutely glorious review, but it does come with a warning. She was the source of anti gonorrhea, so men had to be very careful when they went with her. Of course, yes, there was a very, very big risk of venereal disease. Luckily for them, back then, they only had one venereal disease, yes. or so they thought. Yes. Uh, there was the clap, uh, that's what we would now call gonorrhea, oh. and after that, it was the pox, that's what we would the now call the great pox. Is that, is that the great pox, that's the great pox, absolutely, yes. yes. And syphilis was very prominent during these days, wasn't it? And how did they treat syphilis? Well, pretty much the only cure was the mercury cure. This would be mercury, either applied directly to you, to any ulcers that you might have in the genital area, or taken internally. And the side effects of this were pretty horrendous. I've just undergone the mercury cure myself. Oh, have you? Yes. yes. You, have you, you had, had a touch of syphilis? I have had a little touch of the old touch of hashtag syph. <laughs> so you would, uh, you would sweat profusely for days yes. on end, yes. you would vomit, you would have the runs, and you would produce huge amounts of saliva, eight pints of saliva we would produce today. It's also extremely expensive undergoing the mercury cure. Luckily a gentleman friend has paid for my cure. And most people actually died from mercury poisoning rather than from syphilis. So most people just lived with the dangers of syphilis. And this of course caused great problems because even a virtuous woman could pick something up for her husband, from her husband. Because whoring was basically as common nowadays as men going to watch the football. It was just a common hobby that men had was going whoring. I see. So the great pox of the 18th century. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, today we live in a very delicate age, don't we, with the great pox, uh, the pandemic of 2020. Uh, but of course, you do come on one of our immersive theatrical experiences. We will make sure they are absolutely safe. We will have hand sanitizer. Am I correct in that assumption? You can even wear a mask if you want. With the ugly ones, I suggest it's probably the best thing. Um, but we will make sure that you keep your distance as well. Here in this country at the moment, it's one meter. So if you come any closer, uh, we will have a <laughs> cattle pod. Yes, <laughs> go away. The pox is here. Right, before we end your little dedication today, your little sample, your little taster. Um, I just really want to get a general picture of 18th century London. So I'm going to ask my sex birds, shall we call them? Hashtag sex birds, yes? 
just to sum up exactly what you might hear about on this wonderful, salacious, fluffy sex scandal and sodomy. So, Nicholas, my darling. Well, we shall hear about crime in the 18th century and punishment and thief takers like myself. We were very busy as the population doubled. We were very busy people. Yes. Especially black men in a oh, getting very rich. Getting very rich. Because London was full of wrong Yes. In fact, there wasn't a right in the moment, really. No. no. All wrong -uns. Yes. So they're going to hear about all this as they come on this, you know, soiree. Gallows, pillories, Hiltons with dead cats. Yes. Yes. This is our law expert, by the way. Gentleman Jack, do you come over here? Or maybe I'll come to you, actually. Gentleman Jack, will you be talking about lesbianas? I will. Yes. I will. In fact, the term lesbian actually was introduced in the 18th century, in 1732-ish. Because, of course, there were women. We talked a little bit about relationships between men, homosexual relationships. There were also lesbian relationships, which quite often were probably friendly female relationships. Companions. Companions. Yes, exactly. yes. But no doubt in many cases the relationship went a lot further. But this was not illegal, interesting. To have a, a lesbian relationship was not illegal at all. Um, in fact, in many ways was, I wouldn't say encouraged, but it, it didn't cause any great scam. Yes. It caused a lot of gossip. Oh, I can imagine, yes. And some ladies in those days actually dress as gentlemen. Yes, they did. Yeah, so cross-dressing was around. Cross-dressing. Yes, yes. um, and often would live as a married couple. In fact, there were marriages between two females that were registered yes. in the north of England. Yes. And they were accepted. Yes. And these were very legal unions, quite fully legal. Uh, and one partner would dress as a man and the other as, as a woman. Yes. And they would live for many years in such a relationship. That's lovely. So a little bit of lesbiana there. So, my Madam Speedy Hand here, and I'll take you off on that offer a little bit later, possibly. <laughs> so what else can these lovely people expect? We will talk more about the brothels. We'll talk about high-class courtesans. We'll talk about uh, relations with very high-profile people. Royal family as well. The royals. <laughs> um, also, famous prostitutes, masquerade balls. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, that's your mask versus something else that was going on. Yes. Leonard. Yes. Uh, the very first nightclub, Teresa Cornelli, very, very famous. More about Jack Harris and his little antics. Yes. And also, what was going on? private members clubs and things like that. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, the private members clubs. That's going to be fascinating. Stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. Buggerento, my darling. So, so what else? Well, we will also tell you, because the sex trade was rampant in 18th century England, and for some women it was a way for them to earn their own money and have freedom from male control. But for the vast majority of people who were stuck in the sex trade, this, they were being exploited. Um, and this is very, this is real people really poor people selling the only thing they would ever own, their bodies, for far less than it was ever worth. So we'll tell you the true stories of these people caught in this trade, but some of them wanted to escape, and also the true stories of people caught on the wrong side of the law, the sodomites and the catamites who were pilloried and executed as well. Yes, yes, yes. So it's not all a fairy tale. It's not all glamour, ladies and gentlemen. This isn't Hollywood. Um, and we will get to the nitty gritty and give you some of the Fair facts, shall we say, using the right words there. But for the meanwhile, just keep following us this way, because we're going to conclude our tour at the venue known as Greys and Feathers. And Greys and Feathers is basically, if you've heard of the novelist Charles Dickens, well, this was where Charles Dickens used to write his scripts, his manuscripts. Yes, so we're actually going into a place that actually, once upon a time, was extremely, what it is today, historical. So come this way. I hope you're all still there. How are we doing, Holes? Can you see anybody waving? Is there anybody waving? Wave, wave if you're still there. Are we going? No, can't see anyone. <laughs> Anyways, don't worry, come this way. Mind the cart, Holes. 
beautiful display of flowers. Don't forget, there used to be a flower market here. Okay, back in history. This way, this way, do come this way. What we're going to do in a moment, ladies and gentlemen, if you just keep following me, Holtz. What we're going to do in a moment, when we arrive at Grace and Feathers, we're going to do a little question and answer. So if you've got any uh, questions you'd like to put to any member of the Mary Band of Truth Force, that will be your opportunity. And also on this immersive theatrical experience, ladies and gentlemen, we do a couple of demonstrations, yes. And the demonstration we're going to do for you today will be a band demonstration because as you probably saw some of the members of the class here have their plans and once upon a time this was a secret language and also hankies yes um if you bring it up into modern day of course the hanky took on a different meaning certainly with the game subculture but yes we'll we'll tell you all about the plans in a moment when we arrive at glazy feather so come come this way pulse slight chalk now lady Come on, everybody jog, that's right. We like to keep it big. Don't forget, on this immersive theatrical experience, you're going to do more than 10,000 steps, I can tell you that. <laughs> come this way, come this way. Come on, cards, keep up, everyone, keep up, everyone. Leonard Pins, international homosexual. Here I am. Come on this way. Right, over crossing, ladies and gentlemen, safe, safe, safe. Don't forget to look left, don't forget to look right, and possibly up and down. This way, come this way. Beautiful common garden, it really is worth a visit. As you can see, it's quite quiet at the moment as well. It's nice to take advantage when it's rather quiet, I always say. Oh, Ken Halligan's over there, if you fancy a little bit of man muck. This is the back of the Transport Museum, uh, which is basically, if you just pan over there, holes to the lovely fan lights over there, which was very 18th century, um, but that's the Transport Museum nowadays. But once upon a time, that was indeed the flower market. So all the flowers would be prepared in there. And then of course, people like Eliza Doolittle would go and get her flowers, sell her flowers, and then probably sell her body a little bit later just to make the extra. Oh, well. the sign of the times, ladies and gentlemen. Don't forget your metre distance, ladies and gentlemen, please. It's everywhere. I don't know what it's like in your neck of the woods. We have constant reminders, and it's so important that we do keep these social distancing, and don't forget to always be safe, unlike they were back in the 18th century. Now, our lovely gentleman Jack earlier on mentioned about, you know, the dildage, shall I call it. Um, and of course, contraception back in that day, those days wasn't particularly uh, prevalent, but they did have condoms. Um, they were normally made from um, sheep's skin, um, like the bladder of a sheep's wing. I mean, they could actually stand up on their own. They didn't really need to go inside anything. Okay, here we are. We're now coming. Oh! Nearly knocked over. Yes! <laughs> Let her change. Thank you. Get a lovely shot of this one, Paul. This wonderful establishment, crazy feathers. Absolutely marvellous, wonderful. So here we are. So let's go inside. This way. Oh, it's nice in here. And they've got the rock music in the background. Look at this, ladies and gentlemen, pan around here. It's a wonderful place. There's a birdie over here, doesn't say much. A peacock, a little bit like Bugaranto. Yes. <laughs> right, so this is where we conclude our tour, where there will be a special cocktail waiting for you. A cocktail known as Sex, Scandal, and Sodomy. And you can have some nibbles here with us as well. And we'll do a couple of demonstrations of what was going on in the 18th century. And we're going to start with one of those di little uh, demonstrations now. I'm going to put you there, Holes, that's right. And we're going to do a fan demonstration because as I said, back in the 18th century, there was a special language. Okay, so 
loosey-toosey. I've got my little wrist here. Okay, right, so, if you did this with your plan, it meant I desire your acquaintance. If, however, you used the hanky over the shoulder, that meant, follow me, oh, I say, hello. <laughs> follow me, indeed. Okay, the next one. So what did this mean? Kissing. Oh, I like that. I'm not going to kiss you, though. I should just for that. I am an international homosexual, after all. Okay, the next one. Drawing the hanky across the forehead. We are being watched. Oh, I think we are being watched. Mainly by you. <laughs> the next one is... So what does this mean, my darling? You are cruel. And the next hanky... Oh, I see. So you're clasping it by the centre. Yes. And what did this mean? We'd have to prompt the end. Oh. <laughs> um, let's have a look. Uh, taking it by the centre. <laughs> oh, we are not. <laughs> are you coming on? Ah, you're coming on too strong. Oh, too strong. Well, nowadays we just do this with a bit of that. Right. Oh, too strong. And the next fan. Oh, so quite a positive smack in the hand. What was this indicating, my darling? So mean. So mean. So mean. Oh, yes. Okay, fine. And the next one. Oh, oh dropping the hand. Let's just be friends. Let's be friends. Let's be friends. Oh, this looks a bit pensive. I've had enough. Oh, she's had enough. There we go. So there's this whole immersive language, ladies and gentlemen. I think we ought to adopt this now, don't you? It certainly will be safe, anyway. Right. Oh. You're doing something with your ear, touching your ear. I'm sorry that you've changed. Oh. I'm sorry that you have changed. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Full extended fan there, rubbing it across the palm. Yes, not a very nice face. I hate you. Oh, I see. And finally, ladies and gentlemen. I'm twirling in my left hand. I mean, sod off then. Oh, sod off then. Ah, <laughs> well. We don't want you to sob off just yet, because we would like to know if you've got any questions for us. So if you do have any questions, a little bit like at school, put your hand up and we'll try and get to you. Holes, you may have to run this. Okay. Um, is there anybody there? Yeah. Is there anybody Amazing. there? <laughs> okay. Yes. Oh, yes, we are. We, okay. have, yes. we have a lot of participants asking questions. Uh, first of all, it was a fantastic presentation. I, I was thrilled uh, to see all of you all those stories the outfits are on point actually i'm gonna i'm gonna see if uh if i get the the, the science right like is it uh follow me like this over the shoulder oh, what's he doing <laughs> i can't see i can't see you dear no it's fine we're Holly, gonna move Don, on what's he doing <laughs> over the shoulder oh like that is he touching himself oh been all coy. <laughs> is this a hanky one, dear? Is this hanky, or are you just Exa a fan? A, a hanky. Uh, uh, Remember, I was, we've got two different languages here. It. Yeah. It's a bit like Dutch, Let then French. Right, so. <laughs> Let's go to the first question, shall we? So yes. the first one is: What was the naughtiest area of London back then? Okay. Sodomites walk. Sodomites walk, which would have been in northeast London. Um, of course, this area here, Covent Garden, uh, possibly was probably one of the most rampant, shall we say, uh, where most sexual explicitity uh, used to take place. St. James's, of course, St. James's, uh, but everything there was definitely in temples or brothels, and they were for the rich um, and uh, royalty, shall I say. And Soho for the sex dungeons. Ah, uh, yes. Soho for the sex dungeons. Pleasure gardens for prosperity and exhibitions. Yes, pleasure gardens. There were several pleasure gardens here. Open air spaces, mm. basically. There was one in Vauxhall. Um, if you tap that into the uh, internet, uh, Vauxhall Pleasure Garden, lots have come up about that. Anywhere else, guys? Anybody would like to expand on one of the naughtiest areas in London? Well, Albert, Albert Street. 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 Oh, yes, two penny uprights, knee tremblers. We spoke about those earlier on. Go down Fleet Street, you'll find one there. It's where all the hacks are, where well, they used to be. Uh, they've moved out of there now and whopping. Um, but, anyways, yes, so 
let's just say generally London, as I <laughs> said, was known as the sex capital of the world. So anywhere in London, you could have a good bloody time. I'm sure everybody's taking notes at home. So the next one is, uh, have you had any weird responses from passenger, passers-by uh, as you do this tour? Have we had any weird um, things? It's more buggerante. Well, yeah, so, somebody, somebody didn't understand that I'm pretending to be Princess Buggerante. <laughs> <laughs> And they thought it was real. Obviously, they didn't think I was from the 18th century, but they did think that, you know, something else might happen at the end of the tour. That was a strange response. People do look, of course. <laughs> um, we are dressed in attire from the 18th century. Of course, we're going to attract quite a lot of attention. I personally, whether I'm wearing a suit or this, I still attract uh, quite a lot of attention. Not always the right attention, but yes, um, <laughs> people do stop and stare and of course take lots of photographs. I mean, as we stand here in the wonderful grays and feathers today, there's people outside, taps, should we call them, tapping away. <laughs> I would really like to show you downstairs. Is that okay? Because really, this is where Charles Dickens used to work. So it's very historical. So follow me, follow me. Marvelous, let's take a look. Careful the steps hold. Uh, so make sure you hold on nice and tight. That's Mind the peacock feathers. Apparently they're very unlucky. Come on down here and let's have a look how splendid this beautiful, beautiful establishment is. And this is where we conclude, ladies and gentlemen. This, you will also experience this marvellous, beautiful, salacious venue. Look at this. I need to show the fireplace, Hold the fireplace, so you can imagine back in Dickensian times, Charles Dickens huddled round by the fire, trying to keep warm, yes, devising, having original thoughts. Um, and two, actually, um, two of his novels came from this very place, from his, of course, vivid imagination. So have a look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Just pan around a little bit. That's it, show them this wonderful place. Ah, of course, and here we go. We have, ladies and gentlemen, the reward at the end of your long, immersive theatrical experience. We have the wonderful sex scandal and sodomy cocktail, which I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, will knock your socks off. <laughs> Great. Uh, we have uh, a few more questions. One of, uh, one of them oh, is, yeah. yes, how long would the in-person tour last and do you encourage attendees to dress up too? Yeah. Oh, yes. yes, absolutely. People can dress up. Yes, I mean, if you want to come along in your attire, then please do. The more theatrical, the better. Don't forget, this is a theatrical immersive experience, and we want you to be very much part of it. Um, although we may be relaying the information to you, it is very interactive. So if you want to come along in your brazier, uh, your chaps, or your hoopla skirts, then please do. Um, would you say we're all very immersive, we're all friendly, aren't we? We're very approachable. Oh, yes, very yes, approachable. yes, don't be put off by the way we look. So, in answer to your question, yes, if you want to dress up, bloody well do it! Perfect. Another question is, uh, where did you get your pink shoes? Where did you get your pink shoes? Oh, where did I get my pink shoes? Oh, well, I got them off the 18th century intertet. <laughs> <laughs> they were very cheap, actually, and the buckles do come off. <laughs> I don't go around nice. dressed like this all the time, you know. Nice. No, internet, darling, internet. Great. So we're going to do one last question, and it's uh, one to close the, the, the marvelous tour. How did you come up with the idea for this experience, and where did you research for the history? Okay. Well, everyone um, on this particular immersive theatrical experience is a historian, and we all work so really as guides. Um, and during the lockdown era, of course, we were very bored. All our work has ceased to be. And so basically we thought, let's get together and try something a little bit different. Now don't forget also, ladies and gentlemen, this is not the normal way of guiding 
Um, this is not your normal average tour. This is very much a one-off. And during the lockdown era, we all got together, put our great minds, and they are indeed great minds, together, and we came up with sex scandal and sodomy. And that's what we present to you and everyone. The world! We are ready to take on the world. We are indeed. You sure are. And thank you so, so much for this fantastic tour. You have been uh, incredible. Thank you to our host and everybody who joined. And we look forward to finding more ways to culture with you again soon. So thank you very much, everybody. Oh, you're welcome. And just before you go, just before yes. you go, just remember, ladies and gentlemen, what good is sitting alone in your room? Come hear the music play. Life is a cabaret, old chum. Come to the cabaret. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Standing ovation from everybody. Thank you so, so much. And if you're looking for more uh, virtual experiences, uh, go to tickets.com slash vlog slash awakening weeks to find more. It's been a pleasure. Imagine experiences. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.